folks. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today is the sort of thing that I bump into in the process of developing a, a photovoltaic installation. And <clears throat> as I'm sure has been alluded to in this class, there, there are lots of forms of renewable energy, but the, the form that has really moved um, in, the, in the mix in the last couple of years has been photovoltaics. Two years ago, the cost of an installed system was around $8 per watt. So a, a kilowatt of installed capacity would run about $8,000 to install. Um, this, the system that went in at, at the research center, uh, the research reactor, was on the order of uh, $3.20 uh, a watt to install. So just a, a, a halving of cost, and that trend uh, is continuing. And what it means is that sector of energy production is moving relative to the other energy sources, and it's an exciting time to be involved with it. Um, I don't know if you heard it or not, but NPR a couple of days ago made the point that the sole source of new electrical production in the United States in, this, in the month of March was solar electric. There was no other installed additional capacity. So uh, even though it was, it was only, uh, I think, 400 megawatts, uh, it, it's still a significant uh, change in, in the, the energy mix. So we're living in changing times, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about the process that, that's involved in coming up with the project. Um, usually, I'm approached by somebody. I'm not a great salesman, so um, people call me, and, I, and if I can help them, I will. But uh, usually the project as you might suspect, centers on available resource. And that resource doesn't always take the form that you, you might think that it takes. Um, of course, if someone said, I'd like to do a project, one of the first questions you would ask would be, well, how much do you have to invest in the project? What do you have to spend? So certainly, uh, dollars are a resource consideration in the planning of a project, but um, the flip side is very often there is an expectation for the quantity of energy to be produced. And typically that's expressed as kilowatt hours per month uh, so that folks can, can compare that to their current energy consumption and say, well, I'd like 40% uh, or 30% or 90% of the energy that I currently use as electricity to be provided by the photovoltaics. So the energy resource expectation is part of the design mix. And then surprisingly to me, in, in every project that I bumped into, once those two things are looked at, um, a necessary resource is space to mount the, the solar array because unlike some of the other energy sources, although the, the fuel is free, the, the solar energy is not metered or charged for, um, it's a relatively diffuse um, means of collecting energy, and there has to be a fair amount of real estate of mountable footprint for the solar panels to, to reside in in order to, to fulfill even, even the expectations of I'd like to spend this much money, well, where are you going to put it? Or I'd, I'd like to have this much uh, production, well, you know, what space do you have available to do it? And uh, it's, it's a really significant part of, of what what happens. Um, I'm going to give you a, a couple of, well, I would call two and a half case All right. studies. We can see this small spreadsheet, I, I guess. Um, one, of the, one of the primary things that people <coughs> think about is, uh, well, what do the solar panels cost? And right now, the cost of the solar panels on a retail basis for this example project, 2.35 kW, um, which amounts about 10 solar panels. Uh, would be about a dollar forty-five per watt, and uh, usually the the, uh, the 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 method of assessing the the uh, the value of a system or the economic of the system would be to say what, never mind how big a panel it is, what is the cost per watt of peak power that the panel's rated at, and uh, in this example, and, and this is not far off. A uh, dollar forty-five a watt would be what you would expect uh, working with a dealer providing a system. Now, um, you may hear of, of a glut of Chinese panels coming on the market, uh, and there is in many of the projects uh, a requirement that the panels be American-made, 
uh, and the, the other components be uh, U.S. manufactured. Or, and that adds a bit to the cost, I'd say between um, 35 and 40 cents to the cost of the solar panel itself. And in fact, that, that uh, ratio kind of goes throughout the system. And in this particular example, that was one of the requirements. So you may see panels in, um, uh, approaching a dollar a watt from a Chinese source. They're all warranted for uh, usually 20 years. There's a performance warranty. Uh, however, my experience with the companies from China is they have about a five-year life span. So I'm not really sure what a 20-year warranty means if the provider is, is that, uh, that short-lived. But at any rate, that's part of the mix. And in terms of the total um, cost of the system, it works out to um, around 40%. The other major component of the system is what's called the balance of system. And yeah, you need solar panels, and that's obviously the most uh, um, uh, visible portion of the installation. But you also need a means to condition the electricity from direct current produced by the PV module to alternating current. Um, regardless of whether it's off-grid or whether it's grid-connected, most people, the currency of electricity right now is alternating current. And so that inverter system is uh, part of the cost, and they're, they're, that's in the 70 cent a watt ballpark, uh, a bit less than the solar panel, uh, about half in this case. But there are other balance of system components as well, the wiring, the safety disconnects, the, um, the racking and uh, the mounting hardware, um, and other subsystems that, as a group, are called balance of system. And then finally, labor. I mean, um, you, could, you could sell solar panels out of the back of a pickup truck. Well, actually, that's how I brought them to you uh, <laughs> yesterday. But, um, you know, in order for the system to be viable, it has to be put together by somebody who, who's familiar with um, uh, the electric code and, and the, um, the mechanics and dynamics of, of mounting um, a system and providing for wind load and, and other uh, structural considerations. So in this case, uh, the system came in at about $3.50 a watt installed. And uh, the breakout was about half and half for the balance of the system in the solar panels and about 20% for the installation labor. So if you read in uh, the National Enquirer or some other magazine that they've just developed a solar panel, that's half as expensive as anything that's ever been produced before, uh, the impact in the system would be uh, you know, only a fraction of the total cost. You still have those other components. And as Brent and I were discussing the other day, that balance of system costs and, and re reducing those costs may be really as profound in, in changing the economics of solar electricity as, as anything else, uh, any other component in the system. By the way, if you have questions, at any time, feel free to feel free to ask. Is this a system? Is this like a tracking system, or is this? No, this is a this is a stationary system. So there's a single tilt angle, and a single orientation. And I know you folks have probably covered what's the best direction to face the solar panels, and what's the best tilt angle. Well, latitude is is historically what people say if you're at 39 degrees latitude. So tilt the panels up 39 degrees from horizontal, and that's the best thing. The other thing to remember is, okay, south-facing, uh, latitude tilt, and always mount them shiny side up. <laughs> All right. Well, um, in terms of the system at uh, Muir, um, we, once we, we looked at how many panels or how much production was of interest. Um, we need to look at the site, and, and the site was an area of uh, brickwork in front of the building. And we had probably a couple of months of back and forth discussion about the best configuration for it. And one of, one of the suggestions I had from the get-go was to turn the panels on what's called the portrait uh, view so that the panels were up, up and down in the long dimension. And what that does is it short, shortens the wiring runs and shorts, shortens the racks and, and so on. And I proposed a pair of uh, two rows of panels. Um, the panels themselves were about five feet long, so you might expect two rows of panels would take up about 10 feet. But um, in order for the top of one panel not to shade the bottom of another panel in, in side view, there has to be a separation of the panels. And that's based on 
Um, of course, the vertical dimension and also uh, the latitude. Uh, what's the lowest sun angle, uh, December 21st or thereabouts, uh, that you'll have to accommodate in order to um, have the bottom of the shadow uh, panel not in the shadow of the, of the row in front of it? And this really caused a significant packing factor because um, really it was almost two and a half times uh, or one and a half panel uh, footprints to get the separation between the rows that permitted the panels to operate in full sunlight. And by the way, with photovoltaics, if you throw an inch of shadow anywhere on the surface of any of the panel, that panel essentially shuts down. The, it, the cells are in series, and you interrupt the voltage from one of the cells in the series, and you've got zero volts. Most panels have uh, bypass diodes that say, okay, that one's dead, but at least we can run the others in the row. But Shadow from this front row could actually shut down the back row. In practice, um, professional designers will actually allow that to happen a month out of the year. And the reason is if they had some real estate, a field, for example, to locate the panels on and, and to tilt them up, more total production will result from the other 11 months by bringing the panels closer together and allowing some shade interference to occur. But we didn't want that to happen here at all. And we did try one thing. I, I, um, I tilted the panel back from, from the 39 degree optimum to 30 degrees in both rows. And while it reduced the distance between the rows, it increased the profile of the panel uh, footprint because you know more of the length was now showing. And, and it ended up almost exactly the same to the inch. So uh, this is where we ended up. We actually we turned the panel sideways and did the, the landscape profile. And it, it brought the rows closer together because the panels weren't as high, not throwing as long shadow. And um, uh, that was the ultimate decision. And even though the lengths of the rows are greater for the, um, for the amount of energy being produced, um, ten pan you know, five panels in a row, if you stretch them out, it's a little more diffuse. It worked better with the site geometry. Now, um, you run into this not just on ground mount systems like the one out at the research reactor, but also um, on roof mounted systems. It, usually the interference pattern is not as great a concern there because usually you're, you're working with a roof that has some pitch and you can flush mount the panels so there's no shade interference from one panel to the next. And that allows a pretty dense, um, a pretty dense installation. Well, the, the system at the research reactor is uh, about a um, two and a half kW, two and a half thousand watts, and um, it was a pretty straightforward thing once we, we came into agreement about the, the impact they wanted on the site. Um, there's another uh, project that I, I recently did some design work on, and um, it had to do with some new um, duplexes that were being built by the Eastern Shawnee tribe in, in Seneca, Missouri, and they wanted to do, utilize solar on these buildings. And uh, there were two factors uh, that we kind of went around on. They said, we want to have 40% of an 800 kilowatt hour per month uh, electric bill provided by the solar energy. So I think that was about the 350, 350 watts, uh, kilowatt hours was the requirement for the system. Um, unfortunately, they, they talked about the solar design well after the, um, the building design had been completed and as well as a building layout. So I started talking to them after the pads for these buildings had already been laid. And as you can see, north is up, by the way, there, is, uh, there are a number of orientations for the solar panels in, in that system. The, um, the tendency is, first of all, um, it would require about 14 solar modules in optimum orientation to provide the, the energy that they were talking about. And there's something else kind of magical about the number of 14. You have to have, a, in, with most inverters that do the DC to AC conversion, there's a range of DC voltages that they will accept, and it took at least seven modules at 24 volts to make the DC voltage that the uh, inverters were rated at. So uh, we were forming strings, uh, strings of seven. And uh, the thinking was, all right, this is facing southwest, straight down, of course, to be southwest. So for this building, we'll do um, a southwest orientation 
and the southeast orientation. This is 30 degrees off of due south. This is 60 degrees rotated from due south. Well, the next building, we've rotated it uh, again, and uh, we would have the option of locating the solar string either on this roof or on that roof with an equal amount of energy provided. But now we're rotated 90 degrees off of optimum for the solar panels on that east-facing hip roof facet. And once we rotate again, okay, let's, let's pick up the southwest instead of the northeast facet. So the panels got moved to that roof pit hip and so on, each time trying to have as small a deviation from south as possible for the two sets of strings. And um, going into this, I assume this would be pretty much a disaster. <laughs> that, you know, the, the energy that would be collected by this approach would be a, a pretty significantly reduced fraction of what might be happening in an all, uh, optimum situation. So I suggested an alternate layout, which was a little risky, but um, it at least chose the facet of the roof that was most directly south. And I was able to just fit 14 modules on that, that hip roof component. Now, there is an option here that can be done. These panels uh, that were specced were, uh, are about 15% uh, efficient. 15% of the light that strikes them gets converted to solar energy based on the mounted area of the, of the solar panel. The rule of thumb is on a clear day, perfect conditions, you've got about a, a, a kilowatt striking every square meter of the Earth's surface. And so a 15% module would make about 150 watts per square meter of surface area. Well, there are better modules, not better, there are more efficient modules available. Uh, but on a per watt basis, instead of costing a dollar or a dollar fifty, they're upwards of two dollars or two dollars and a quarter per watt. Why? Well, because in situations like this, you can get more electrical production in the limited roof area that's available in order to bring the expectations of energy production up to where the customer was interested. So now you're you're going back and forth. Well. Do you want the energy or do you want to spend the dollars because the space is driving, you know, a decision to be made with one or the other? Uh, I believed that this would make a pretty significant difference in the energy production because I never had an east or a west facing um, array. And even though these rows were split uh, geometrically, they could still be wired together as rows of seven. So that was my proposal. So I did some uh, energy calculations. and. I, I used uh, free software. Uh, there's some software. If you Google PV watts, uh, it'll direct you to the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL lab uh, site, and there is online software that will let you tell um, the direction, the, the compass direction of the mounting, the angle uh, lifted from horizontal and the location, uh, whether you're in southwest Missouri or, or northwest Minnesota, it'll allow you to select a location that, uh, that takes into account the weather conditions. And doing all of that permits you to, um, to do an estimate of the energy production on a month by month or even a, a, an hour by hour basis within a month. So pretty powerful software. Uh, written by some very competent people. All right, now I need to shrink the size. I know, everybody's on the edge of their chair. <laughs> um, so I put in some of that information. The, uh, this is just a spreadsheet in which I, I compiled the information provided by the software. So I had two options. We had um, 612 roof, which works out to a 26 degree tilt angle. And then for each of those building options, I either uh, took the optimum roof area, uh, roof orientation, and put all 14 modules on it, or I split the orientation between that direction and the uh, closest other direction on the roof. And then in summary, um, I worked up the, um, the kilowatt hours per month that would result from those two strategies. So uh, best angled roof as a single array on one hip, uh, 
gave an average of 387 kilowatt hours a month from the installed uh, 22 kilowatts of, of solar panels. For the six buildings, this is what was being produced per building on the average. And the less desirable angle where you had, in some cases, um, well, uh, 30 or more degrees off of, uh, well, 90 degrees from the best angle is where the next option was. Uh, it was 375 per month. For the second duplex unit, 396 versus 361, 387 versus 374. Are you, are you shocked and horrified by the difference between uh, taking the most optimum surface available or splitting it between two surfaces? It, it's not very compelling to be, to be um, um, a decision of how much different one strategy is over the other. It worked out this, over the course of the year, 5.4% improvement by taking the best available angle and populating it fully with the panels. So what would I suggest? Well, I'd suggest doing that, but as far as, um, you know, it's, if, the, if the customer said, you know, I, I like the look of the other better, uh, well, then that, that's, what, that's what I'll do. <laughs> So um, interesting study. I think it's going to move forward. Oh, and by the way, they, they told me up front that the reason they were able to think about doing a photovoltaic install was that they, um, they had a contractor that build, bid the construction of the duplexes $100,000 less than the grant they had for producing the buildings. So they told me up front, uh, we have $100,000 to spend. <laughs> And I know for a fact another person bidding on the project said, yep, that's exactly what it'll cost, 100 grand. And uh, on a per watt basis, I think this came out a little less than $4 a watt because of the buy U.S. requirements they had. And so it, it ended up a little under $90,000 for the number of panels or the, the capacity that they wanted to install. And by the way, as it worked out, uh, with either option, on the average month, um, the, the occupants of the building will have 40% of their electricity produced by PV. It, all of, either option provided more than 350 kilowatt hours a month. The half study that I'd like to talk about is uh, sub, something that uh, Dr. Devaney and, and Gayla Newmeyer and Ben Barnhart have been working on as a proposal for the VFW building here in Columbia, Missouri. And no one has said how much money there is to spend, and no one has said how much energy they want to produce, although uh, a really detailed study, even hour by hour, is being conducted on that premise. But the real issue is where do we put this uh, probably 100 or so solar panels in the space that's provided? And I'm, I apologize that I don't really have a site plan, but the two options are basically mounting it on a roof that faces east and west, and it's, a, it's about a 212 pitch on the roof, which works out to a little less than 10 degrees. Very shallow roof pitch. Or locating the panels uh, as a field mount uh, in a parking lot. And actually, we're viewing it, if we were viewing it shiny side up and from the south, um, the panels would be in rows coming off either the west side of the building or coming off rows on oops, west side or at the east side of the building. So ground mount tilted up very much like what was done at, uh, at Murr or on the building. Now, um, if you think about it, a building with a ridge that runs north-south with an east or a west facing roof could have the panels optimally oriented by tipping the panels up on the roof and put it at you know the 39 degree pitch angle and and populate the roof with panels sticking up off the roof on struts but um, Dr. Devaney very correctly pointed out the potential for wind loading on this building is considerable if you build all these little catchment flaps up in the air to, to catch the wind and that would require really a structural analysis of the building to confirm that it could withstand those forces. And unfortunately, if you had a tornado coming through, two things would probably happen. The solar panels would probably leave, and the building would probably get flattened. So 
you know, in extreme conditions, even if you're planning for 90 miles an hour, if, they're, if it's 160 miles an hour, all bets are off. Um, so not a very good roof option. And the roof, the roof potential is complicated by the fact that if you, if you were to mount the panels flat on the roof so that there was very little profile to the wind, in other words, flush mount them, um, they're, they're facing the wrong direction. If you put them on that roof facet, it'd be facing west instead of south. If you put it on that facet, it'd be facing east instead of south, and at a very shallow angle. So uh, what did PV Watts tell me when I went and looked at, I just threw a number out, 28 kW, about 10 times what's over at the research reactor. What would that look like with the three options? And a screen print of what PV Watts put out. And I don't know if you can read it, but let me just walk you through it. it Columbia is one of the locations that they have a full set of weather data for. And they give the latitude and longitude of that um, location plus the elevation above sea level. The DC rating I input, I said, let's give it 28 kW of rating. And then the software does a D rate factor and said, OK, you're putting in 28 kW of solar panels. Um, how much energy is lost in going from the direct current of the solar panels to the grid output, the alternating current that will be delivered um, to the customer? And their standard D rate is 77% um, of the energy being produced. And you can override that. If you look at component level, it, that seems like an, a very low um, estimate because the inverters now are 90, 90 to 95 percent efficient. Um, you know, if, if that's the case, where are all the losses? Why, why aren't you getting anything close to 90 percent out of the system once you leave the solar panels? And the answer to that has to do with a number of uh, things like loss in the wiring, uh, loss in switches, um, and, and other factors that reduce efficiencies. And actually, the 77 percent number isn't that far from, from what I would estimate, taking those individual losses into consideration. And even if it is a little low in terms of the percentage that gets delivered, it's best to be a little bit um, pessimistic on output. That way you, you won't be disappointed. Uh, the other thing is, is a fixed array. Oh, and I meant to say something about the question about fixed versus rotating arrays. The amount of energy that you can get by tracking the sun uh, in a single axis tractor, one that swings from left to right, is about 30% more than a fixed solar panel um, area or orientation over a 12 month period. So, about a 30% improvement out of this investment in solar panels. Unfortunately, the cost of the balance of system for a tracking array is set at about 30% above the cost of a, of a fixed mount. So economically, it's a wash unless you have uh, other good reasons to, to make a tracking array. So back to the example. Fixed array. This one said, um, let's tilt it up at 38 degrees, your latitude. Let's uh, point it due south and see what happens. And what happened was uh, a month-by-month -month output, the... Um, the output is given in kilowatt hours of, of alternating current, and it goes something from a low in December of uh, 2,100 2, kilowatt hours to a peak in July uh, or August, really, of 3,500 kilowatt hours. So um, it's not too surprising you'd have a summer peak because there are more hours of sunlight. There's less cloudy weather than in the wintertime. It's what? 40% cloud cover in December. And, um, and the sun actually spends more time um, hitting a south-facing surface there at that time of year than it, than it does uh, during the, the winter solstice. So, okay, can we, can we kind of record that number? Total uh, for the system for the year is 36,978 kilowatt hours and total for the year. Well, now let's do something really foolish. Let's take that same 20 k, 28 kW and let's mount it on the west-facing roof. Not the proper tilt angle, not the proper orientation. 
What does PV watts have to say? Here are the inputs, 28 kW, um, array tilt, 9.5 degrees, array azimuth, that is compass direction, 270 degrees, read them and weep. Uh, total for the year, 31,549. And the best month is in July, 37.91. Well, this is uh, a bit different. Uh, somebody help me out. Is it a little more than? It's not 15% different. It's but uh, right in that ballpark a 15% reduction in the total kilowatt hours produced every year. But what about this, uh, this summer sun? With the optimum orientation, using the conventional wisdom of point it south, tilt it up at to latitude, it's making 3,500 kilowatt hours, but it's making nearly 3,800 kilowatt hours in that summer month. And uh, when Dr. Devaney heard about this, he said, well, this is it, man, because there are two things that facility is being charged for. It's being charged for the kilowatt hours, just like a residence would be. You use this much electricity. But it's also being charged for its peak electrical consumption, which means they take, what, the, the worst 30 minutes. 30 minutes out of the year and said, you used a peak of well, not, whatever number of kilowatt hours, and... Not only that month, but every other month of the year, we're going, to cut, we're going to put a surcharge on your electric bill that reflects this gluttonous power consumption that you had on this bad day in summer. And summer is the time that that peak uh, load occurs. Well, it turns out, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the cost of the peak factor charge is 1.6 times the cost of the kilowatt hour charge. It is more than half their electric bill that they're paying because for 30 minutes they use too much power. So now this, this number for a month that corresponds during the highest heating or cooling loads on the building for that month becomes very significant in the overall economics of the project. The project will pay for itself much more quickly if they can reduce their peak needs. Now there's another element that comes into this and, and Usually when my company is involved with a project, it's turnkey from design through completion. We do, we do design, build. And the first things we look at are energy management, and most notably, the energy efficiency of the building and its contents. The envelope, you know, what's it using, and where does the energy for heating and cooling the building come from, and also what you populate the inside of the building with in the way of appliances and fixtures. And we generally uh, start with reducing the energy consumption of the building, at least in the heating and cooling side of things, to be 30% of a, quote, typical building of the same size. And we do that by better insulation, air-to-air -air heat exchangers, and passive solar, which involves south-facing windows with a proper overhang, um, to reduce the heating load. And then... That same overhang shades the glass in the summertime, so we're not increasing the, 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 the cooling load of the building by having those south-facing windows. So that's where we start. And then if you have money left over or if you have an interest, well, I guess both things have to be true, then we can talk about active solar, the photovoltaics or, or solar hot water heating, solar water heating. Um, well, one of the things that needs to be looked at at the VFW is not what the solar panels can do to the electric bill, but what conservation or efficiency measures within the building uh, can do to reduce that electric bill and, as a matter, uh, by the way, the peak loading of the building. Um, you can address the overall bill by better insulation. You can address the peak by better building management. For example, if you let the co cooling system operate at 3.30 in the afternoon and everybody's arriving for the evening bingo activities and you have this huge you know, amount of air exchange and, and new heat coming into the building from the occupants, 
you might pre-cool in anticipation of that in the hours before the building's occupied so that it's a little chilly when they walk in, but you don't have this huge air conditioning load while they're there. You spread it out so you don't have as big a peak. And some of those strategies on a cost basis will be a lot more effective than slapping solar energy on top of the building, but a flush-mounted system gets the collectors out of harm's way in terms of vandalism and theft and damage from uh, weed eaters. And up on top of the building where it's, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, and, and has a pretty good survival rate for the anticipated 20-year period. Um, I, um, I alluded to the changing economics of solar photovoltaics with other energy sources, and um, I'd like to I'd talk to that uh, for just a second more, but are there any questions about this point? As it turns out, that the three rules pointed south, tilted up, and shiny side up. It turns out shiny side up is the most important <laughs> of the three considerations because there's really a, a, a very um, forgiving um, orientation um, option uh, for photovoltaics to work well. Now, the, the rules for orienting actually are a legacy from an earlier type of solar, which is solar thermal. And... Um, Solar thermal panels use selective surfaces to absorb light and create heat. They use a dead air space in front of the absorber to make uh, insulation on the front of the panel. And then the back of the panel is insulated to prevent heat loss out the back side. And then on the absorber surface, there, there's a circulation provision so that water or glycol that's circulated through the panel gets heated by the panel. And um, the... The classic application is for solar domestic hot water, where you're providing water for showers, laundry, and, and uh, dishwashing, and so on, uh, using solar heat rather than making electricity and running an electric device that does those things. And the rule of thumb has been that you can pay back a well-oriented solar thermal system in six to eight years. And that that should be a no-brainer. Put solar domestic hot water on your building, and you've cut the energy bill of, say, a residence by 30 bucks a month. It's a great deal. Um, that orientation for a thermal panel is pretty critical because if a thermal panel in the middle of winter is hit with 30% of the available full sun that you'd have it at other times, it won't get hot enough to turn the pumps on to make hot water. Um, it has to be properly oriented, and probably in the wintertime, it's only going to make energy a couple of hours out of the day. And in the summertime, that same solar panel will make um, three or four times as much heat as it does in the wintertime. So what are you going to do? You size the panel to take care of the average, most likely, and you have overproduction in the summertime. What happens to the additional thermal energy produced by a solar hot water system, a solar he water heating system? Well, typically the pumps turn off when the tank gets to a certain temperature and say from 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon on, you're getting absolutely no use out of the investment you've made in that solar system. With photovoltaics, there are two difference, differences, and one is rather than needing a certain amount of sunlight before it starts producing energy, the output of a PV array will be roughly proportional to the light intensity striking to that array. So if you get 28 kW in full sunlight under optimum conditions, if you have a cloudy day, day where there's just 20% solar intensity, you'll get 20% of what you would get on a full sunny day. So it operates in conditions that are much less ideal, much more marginal than the solar thermal systems do. So per square meter of uh, panel installed, uh, you have the potential of making more uh, energy conversion. Now, the, the other thing about the uh, PV system is that most of them are hooked to the grid in what's called net metering, where if your building is consuming, say, two kilowatts of power at any moment in time, and the PV system is making 4 kW, the difference goes out on the grid and supplies electrical customers uh, on the remainder of the grid. If 
say at night you're drawing 2 kW and the PV system's producing nothing, the, those kilowatt hours come back from the grid. And in the end, if you produce more, no more than you consume, it's a wash. You're given credit for. Um, uh, it's like minutes on a cell phone. If you don't use all your minutes, they're carried over into the next month. They zero it out once a year. But in the situation that I described in the summertime with a hot water system, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and the pumps turn off. With a PV system, that doesn't happen. If you don't need all that power, it continues to be available to other customers. So it's a, it's a greater utilization of, of the conversion resource. And in the last couple of months, I have discovered when you consider the greater um, on time of the PV system and the cost of the PV system compared to uh, a solar thermal system, it's uh, no longer one option. It's actually, if it works for thermal, the same investment will actually give you more energy as electricity. And what I'm saying is instead of making hot water with a thermal panel and storing that in the tank, make electricity with a PV module and run a hot water heater that's electric, and then if you have extra, it goes out to the grid. That's a big change. Uh, two years ago, uh, that, that idea would, be, would have been blasphemy <laughs> if it just wouldn't have held, held water, so to speak. So that's part of the changing times. And it's, uh, as I said, it's a really exciting time to be involved uh, with this technology. Now, I have a question. Uh, um, how, how many folks in the room are uh, nuclear engineers or in the engineering program? One or you're pretty knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, what's your prospect? What do you think the prospect is for uh, uh, nuclear fusion in terms of how far we are out from from utilizing that form of nuclear energy? I have a lot of faith in nuclear power. I understand. And and uh, actually, as part of the transitional mix, uh, most environmentally oriented folks look at it as being a a phenomenal alternative to uh, burning carbon. But on this fusion thing, um, so how, you know, is there sort of a, a consensus in the industry as to how far we are, we're out before we move away from 235 and move into Mr. Fusion, so to speak? Well, I would submit, when I was in college, it, the, the conventional wisdom is we're about 20 years out. And about 15 years ago, I was reading about it and said, the conventional wisdom is we're about 20 years out. And I suspect you could find documentation similar to that today. But I would submit to you that uh, nuclear fusion right now is very wide, widely utilized. Now, the reactor is a fair distance away. It's around 93 million miles out there. But we have the means of <laughs> utilizing nuclear fusion right now in the form of uh, solar conversion. And in fact, that's driving all of the biological energy sources and systems on Earth. So it's a very, it's a very compelling source of energy, in my view. Well, th thanks, thanks very much for letting me talk to you this afternoon. Appreciate it.